if you could all take your seats or stand or what have you, um, I was told to ask you to turn your phones off or put your phasers on stun. Um, this is a panel called Monetize Me, Brand Building at the Intersection of Sports, Entertainment, and Media. I want to thank the United Talent Agency for bringing everybody here together today. That was an applause line. If you want to, I mean, we could okay. get some energy going in the room. Uh, I'm Rich Eisen. I'm your moderator for the event, and I'm honored to have the panel to my left. Um, sports, entertainment, media, advertising, brands, everybody uh, is represented in one way, shape, or form uh, to my left. So let's uh, make some introductions. If you know sports, you know this man. He's the CEO of Digital Television and Film Production Company uh, called Spring Hill Entertainment and the CEO of Uninterrupted a digital platform for streaming video and podcasts from pro athletes, both co-founder with his longtime friend and business partner, LeBron James. Put your hands together. That's Maverick Carter right over there. This gentleman, there you go. Uh, this gentleman is a partner and manager of the recording artist Drake, whose most recent album, Views, was the first to hit one billion streams on Apple Music. Uh, and with Future by his side, that is just the beginning. Their empire also includes OVO, sound, recording label, fashion line, music festival, and Drake's own whiskey, Virginia Black. Put your hands together for Future, right over there. Adele Noor. Also, uh, this gentleman is celebrated filmmaker from Varsity Blues on the big screen to Smallville and One Tree Hill for tele television. But with traditional media faltering in its attempts to connect with young audiences, he decided in 2012 to fish where the fish were, going purely digital. Working closely with UTA, he co-founded Awesomeness TV, the teen-skewed YouTube channel, which was sold to DreamWorks Animation the following year. That's Brian Robbins in the middle. Bono, LeBron, Arnold, Pharrell, Dr. Dre, and the Boston Red Sox. What do they all have in common? This guy at the end of our set. <laughs> The founder and CEO of financial and asset management advisory firm Main Street Advisors, but his client list is anything but. He's got a unique inside vantage point on the structure and value of the deals we are here to discuss. That's Paul Wachter at the end of the set over there. And last but not least, the man who helped bring this all together, uh, my agent, boss's boss, uh, the CEO and managing director of UTA, a huge force in a fast-changing entertainment industry representing some of the biggest names, film, digital, music, sports, news, theater, literature, fine arts, and television. Uh, I can tell from uh, personal experience, UTA is passionate about representing talent and helping us adapt and capitalizing on a fast-changing technology and media landscape. Jeremy Zimmer, the CEO and Managing Director of UTA. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Hey, you're, you're really good at that. Can you introduce me every day? Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> if you want to really set it to Maverick, if you want to set it to music, we can do that. <laughs> we can do Who whatever do I talk you to wish. Jerry, Jeremy, your yeah. Agent? Yes. Yeah. Okay. yes. Talk Jeremy, to my we'll agent, Maverick. They're all over the room. <laughs> They're all over the place. And as you can see, I'm already into the branding thing because on the back of the cards is my show logo. <laughs> my name. That's awesome. 12 to 3 every day on the East Coast, DirecTV, <laughs> iHeartRadio, um, AT&T. At any rate, this, this panel uh, is all about, like I said, the converging cross-section of entertainment, celebrity and entertainment, celebrity and sports and entertainment. So I just want to get this thing started. When, when you are pitched as folks who are trying to get this thing right in this world, as you do so appropriately, how do you separate when people are trying to make brands and come to you with brands' ideas or try to get you involved with their brand, how do you separate the good, the bad, and the ugly? Do you want to handle that first? Sure. I mean, the, the, to me, the key thing about it is always, remember uh, in the graduate plastics? Remember that? Sure. They're all too young to remember that. I but, remember. <laughs> you remember. I have no idea, Paul. But, oh, my uh, gosh. <laughs> You should watch that movie in future. Um, it has to be organic. So the key thing is what, what really bothers me is when someone comes with an idea that has nothing to do with the celebrity or the person that they're talking about. So in other words, you know, in, in good examples, for example, uh, Maverick and I many years ago with actually Rodney, who's standing back there, did a deal with Cannondale Bikes for LeBron. Well, because LeBron liked to ride bikes and train with bikes. We did uh, deals, I did an interesting deal uh, for Bono a couple of years ago 
where um, he designed a line of sunglasses with Revo, because Bono is one of the most famous sunglass wearers in the world. He wears them on stage. He has some eye problems, which is why he always wears sunglasses. And we gave the money all to uh, support AIDS uh, relief in Africa. Those are organic things. Like Bono is interested in AIDS relief. Bono wears sunglasses. LeBron likes bikes. People come in with the craziest stuff. So the key thing I find is always to just immediately, if it's not organic to the person, just, just drop it. Even if you can make money on it, it's just not going to work. And, it, and it, even if it works, it's just not good for the person's career. Maverick, what do you think? I would say, I mean, what Paul said is absolutely correct. But also, in this business, just like in any other business, you really have to have a sense for people because there are all types of people that come at you. And I would also say the one thing about you know, and my partner LeBron and working with him is that even people who are very smart with great track records who've been successful at other things will come in with stupid shit. So <laughs> you have to like, literally like, you know, you'll, you'll get a lot of yo-yos and people who don't know what they're doing, but also you get people who really did something well before, but they come in with bad ideas or, and you have to have a, a feeling in your gut and a sense for to what Paul was saying, what's authentic to LeBron, what he can put his name on, what he can put his face in front of, but also just if this person knows what they're talking about and have a, have a passion or a sense for what they're about to embark on. Because ultimately, you know, if we're going into business with someone to build a brand, we can do what we do, but we need that person to deliver on what they say they can do too. So you have to have a feel for if they really can or cannot deliver on what they say they're about to do. Future, can you tell when somebody walks in the room right away? Yeah, I think more important than that for us, it's, you know, we spend so much time and so much effort creating what makes us valuable to brands that protecting that is the most important thing. When you spend so much time on your craft and with us and what we do at OVO and what we do at Drake, even if it's a great opportunity, more important, you got to kind of evaluate the risk and what does, what's that going to do to your main business if it doesn't go right, if it doesn't work. There's so many things in business that can go wrong. If, if building a business was easy, everybody would build a business every single day. And it just doesn't work like that. So when you're assessing something, there, there, it's all those things that matter. It has to be authentic. For a guy like Drake, it, doesn't, it has to not feel like work. It has to feel like an extension of who he already is, to Paul's point. And to Maverick's point, it's you know, you're depending on, I need Drake to make hit records. I need Drake to make music. I need Drake to focus on what he loves to do, which is his main thing. And anything that we build around him should be an extension of things that he can easily deliver on versus making it a world of an effort because you're the person you got into business with has no clue what they're doing or what they're talking about and just has a great idea. It's, it, it, you know, it, the simplest thing people forget is, is it's always better to have somebody that can execute that has like a somewhat decent idea than it is to have somebody with a great idea that can execute. So we just kind of really value what can go wrong, what the risks are, and always respect our main business, which is if we're going to get into any business, it has to make sure to grow that main business and not hurt that main business. Brian, when people approach you or with a deal or anybody that you're associated, what's the thing that you most wish they knew and the most common mistake that's made? It's funny, I think a lot of people love to identify an opportunity, right? Which we all do, we all could look around and go, God, you know, water or whatever it is. And people love to identify white spaces, but white spaces don't actually always turn into great businesses, right? And I think what both these guys are saying, the same thing. Yes, you have to identify a white space, but you also have to have the passion and more importantly, the expertise in that space to make it work. You know, when I did Awesomeness, I went right to the thing I knew, which was making content for a demographic that I made for 20 years. It was second nature to me, but I also saw a great opportunity. And I think that's what you have to look for. What do you think your role is in this, Jeremy? Um, I think our role is to be smart facilitators where when we're representing talent and uh, 
to help make sure that they're doing something that's going to be additive to their brand, not subtract from their brand. That ultimately, what Future talked about, that the main role of our artist is to do what the thing they do great, and then if we're going to build businesses around that, make sure it's going to be, first of all, it's not going to detract from their brand, and secondly, it's not going to take them so far away from what they need to do and love to do that it's going to end up being a detriment to their long-term career. So we have to help evaluate the whole picture, make sure they understand the cost-benefit analysis. One of the big words at this conference is disintermediation, uh, a uh, definition of which I'm glad is on this card. Um, <laughs> you mind reading it? Uh, yeah, you Maverick, I, I got it for you. I'm, I'm so glad. To it. I'm first so spell, glad. First spell it, then read it. And I'm glad it's also on this card that it's a big word at this conference because I was too busy putting out another Rich Eisen show from 12 to 3 Eastern. <laughs> Nine, noon Pacific. Uh, it's called, it's cutting out the middleman. Uh, the artist, athlete, entrepreneur developing direct pathways to the fans, uh, and that is the trend, essentially. So we talk on the business side about the economic challenges of digital disruption. What is the uh, void being filled by innovative approaches where m there's a massive opportunity for talent with the right playbook? So what is the void being filled by these innovative approaches? I would say the void that's being filled <clears throat> and uh, it's funny you say that and talk about that. That's the business, the latest business that we created in our building is is called Uninterrupted. And it's a digital media platform for athletes to tell stories that are really resonate with them directly to the fan. Obviously, Rich, you have a fantastic show and worked at a gigantic sports media company for a long time mm -hmm. that is going through some change and, and have to figure that out. The ESPN has a fantastic brand, but they have to figure out what stories they want to tell, and they're picking the stories for a long time that matter to ESPN. I'm sure you sit in many, many production meetings for Sports Center and different shows and pick the highlights and the things that matter to you guys and your producers. Well, uninterrupted, we do those same meetings, but with athletes. We tell the stories that the athletes really give a shit about. So we've told a story about a, a girl who was a Muslim who FIBA wouldn't let her play after college because she wore a hijab, so called Allah hijab. We've told we're working on a story right now about cannabis and sports. This is a story that athletes care about, and we help them figure out how to shape that story, how to format that story, and how to get that story distributed. And technology has allowed athletes and such, and whether it's entertainers or whatever, to get that direct connection to the, to the fan and to their consumer and allow them to tell the stories that they really care about instead of the stories that the big media companies care about. And I think that's what's going on, and that's, that's a disruption. That's what I saw and that we went after. And honestly, you know, it's been working very well because we now have a long line of athletes wanting to work with us to tell their story. We're working on a story right now with an athlete who wanted to show the human side of free agency instead of just talking about how much money is he going to make, what team he's going to play for. So we're doing a whole story on free agency, and he's talking about, I just want to be at a place where I have fun, I, where the, I like my other teammates, just like everyone else at work. So I think that's what we're doing um, at Uninterrupted very well, and I think that's just going to continue as technology evolves and evolves and mobile gets more and more diverse around the globe. Yeah, I, I would add something. I think, like, going back to your first question, it, it's, it's the same thing, which is there's good examples of it and there's bad examples of it. So everybody is into disruption and disintermediation. But the fact is their cases uninterrupted is a really good example of it where the whole, the whole sense of the thing is to allow the athletes to talk directly to the fans without someone in between. There's another company that we're involved with called Attention where different people, celebrities, but not just celebrities, people can talk about issues they care about. They can go direct through video uh, on Facebook to talk about issues. But just because there are good examples of it, the, the real thing is that because you can, everybody wants to do it, right? Because now you can go direct to the fans. That doesn't mean that every time you're going directly to the fans or directly to, your, to the people who care about you, it's the right thing to do. So there's a, a, a just a lot of celebrities that are starting apparel lines, clothing lines, you know, liquor lines, this lines, that lines. Because you can, you have the ability now, instead of hiring marketing companies and having to go, like when we started Beats, we had to go through Best Buy, right? 
we, Best Buy was the key to our business at the beginning, we were able to reach fans through the marketing, through the videos, the music videos, LeBron did a lot to help us reach the fans, but we still, the, the business went through the traditional wholesale retail channels. Now you don't need to do it as much. That doesn't mean every business is meant to be like that, and that doesn't mean it's always right. So the, re the reason I point that out is that Uninterrupted is such a good example of disintermediation because it's the whole point of it. And uh, I think, you know, if you remember like um, the Richard Sherman when he got into that huge fight with the reporter and then Beats did this commercial that they had already filmed at the time of Richard Sherman putting the headphones on and to hear what you want to hear or whatever it was. And that was sort of, that's the same thing. It's like kind of maybe it's time for athletes not to have to have reporters sticking microphones in their mouth in their face going, you know, what do you think, you know, why'd you play so bad? So I think, I think again, it, there's good examples of it and bad, but go back to your first question, people come into our office every day with, you know, some celebrity idea that they can go directly to the public, and that doesn't mean it's a good idea. Well, speaking of somebody who is actually a conduit to the fans, um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but you're not disintermediate. No, no, no. I, but <laughs> but uh, no, it's interesting though because you know I, in my job, fight the perception of when well, we're branding that there's a lot of people in my position who are opinionators. Uh, there may be one particular troll uh, in my business who likes to poop all over somebody's uh, business partner all the time uh, and build his brand doing that. And it's very difficult for those of us who are opinionators in this business to be able to tell a story as well as understand that there's such a thing as nuance that somebody <laughs> could actually be the all-time great as well as other things uh, on the planet as well as have an off night but all that said I'm, I'm curious just to return to what you're saying Maverick how many athletes are interested in doing what you are attempting with uninterrupted how many do you have to like I think uh, bleed to that water we, there I was just looking at the number we to date, and we are, I think, 17 months in or something. I don't remember. I think seven, less than two years, a little more than a year and a half in to building uninterrupted, and we've worked with 125 athletes, and the line is growing every day because they're really understanding that our our goal and our job at uninterrupted is to take what they care about and shape it and format into a story that the fans can digest and into rich content because they obviously could go do things on their social, but we, our job is to show them that we have producers and we work with a gentleman, our creative director is a guy named Gotham Chopra, who's a fantastic sports filmmaker, made films for Showtime and HBO that our producers and our team can take it and make it. We've done a documentary that was a 90 minutes called Fight Mom about a mom who has to, the juxtaposition of fighting, her job is to fight, to kick ass, but at home she has to be a mom and raise a, a little baby. So the juxtaposition that, we, that took the shape of a 60 minute uh, documentary that we later licensed to Fox. We've also did a story with Chris Bosh when he was having, he wanted to tell a story about having his fight with the Miami Heat because they wouldn't let him play anymore. They wouldn't clear him to play. So that took the shape of a series we called Rebuilt where we did a uh, five, five to six minute uh, docu-series following them throughout. So our job is to take the stories that the athletes really care about and shape them into shows, into formats that are really resonate with the fans and really travel and be distributed everywhere. And they're starting to see that. We have more and more athletes coming to us every single day. And I think, you know, LeBron and I, this all started because when he switched teams twice, he's now switched teams twice. He went from the Cavs to the Heat and the Heat back to the Cavs. Both times, our objective was well, let's disrupt things, and not disrupt things for the sake of disruption. Let's disrupt the first time because we want to deliver the message the way we want to, and also we had a business opportunity with your former company <laughs> that they allowed us to own the media, and though the show was produced poorly, we made three and a half million dollars and gave it away, so I would never take it back. I would do it again because we gave three and a half million dollars away, and everyone... <laughs> shit on it and said it was the worst thing that's ever happened and blah, 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 blah. Funny enough, when he went back to Cleveland, we did the same thing. We just picked a different medium. We just wrote a letter. And so 
my point is those two times were the were the were the the birth child of the idea of uninterrupted. Of how do we create this? And now it's accepted, and every athlete wants to do it. What void do you think you're filling with your no, Ron? What what right. what, what what void do you think that you're filling with everything that's going on right now with your business? Well. I mean, very different than these two guys, sure. right? Because they were right. dealing with these global icons right. and, and you know, are constantly building big businesses with them. For me, we looked at, there were two major shifts going on in, in media that I think uh, traditional media companies weren't paying attention to. One was uh, technology was changing things in a major way and we were about to consume or were consuming video in a much different way than even from the beginning of cable and the way we were interacting with video. And two, millennials were getting older. And quite frankly, their influence on pop culture was uh, dissipating. Uh, you know, Facebook's 13 years old. You know, uh, MTV runs Friends at, you know, from five to seven every night of reruns. <laughs> and, and we looked at Gen Z, which was 12 to sort of 24 year olds and said, they're being ignored and no one's making content for them and brands have no way to reach them. So we looked at that audience and said, okay, let's super serve them. And the first thing we did, which is similar but different than you know LeBron or, or, or Drake, is we looked at these teen social media stars who most people in this room probably have no idea except for the agents who, who they, they are. We put them in our content, made them stars of our shows, put that, that content in our feed, made programming that was authentic to them and, and inspirational and that they could interact with, and then told stories that I guess, you know, with, with kids of all different races and sexuality, um, and colors and, and just really made content that they could relate to. And from that, we built a brand. And, and the interesting part is when we started five years ago, we had no media dollars to do this, right? So these kids were our marketing and our content was our marketing and our marketing was our content. And you know, in two and a half, three years, we went from a YouTube channel to building a company that was almost worth a billion dollars. So totally, that's the story in a nutshell. So. Wow. <laughs> um, what, what would you say to the answer to the question then? Yeah, I just, I, I don't, I, more than anybody, it affected our business. You know, you could wake up one day and I remember, I, I remember clearly, like we woke, people woke up on February 14th or 15th of 2015 and with like without knowing what was going on there was a drake album out and all it was was a twitter link to itunes and it was like go buy my album why'd you do that um it was just important to us to control what was important to us which was the music it was like listen we're not going to go to every late night tv show we're not going to go tell you everywhere and get billboards and tell you to go listen to our music we're not going to we're not going to run around and spend eight weeks, you know, jamming it down your throat. We're just going to say, here's our offering. You like it, listen to it. You don't like it, don't listen to it. And, you know, it, it essentially super serves the people that care most about your music because you don't put them through this whole cycle just to get to the product, which is what you're getting to. You know, and I feel like before in the music business, and, and you're going to start seeing it now, um, you know, somebody would put a single out and it'd be this engineered song and they'd get the best producers and the best writers and they'd shoot the glamorous video and they'd put that single out and everybody listened to that single for eight weeks and then you went to the record store and you bought the CD for fifteen ninety nine and you woke up and you listened to the rest of that album and there was literally nothing good on it. And you got sold a dream based on one song that you thought was good and that was it, you know, and, and you were stuck, by the way. You were stuck. You didn't even have, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you didn't even have the opportunity to go tell the world that it sucked. You had to let, you had, you had to let other people find out for themselves, you know? Like, you know, Jeremy goes to the record store and buys it and listens to it and says it sucks. The only thing he can do is call me and say, yeah, I don't buy it, it sucks, right. you know? But other than that, like, there's no way to spread that message wide and clear. So for us, it was, 
we feel extremely confident in the music we make. We feel extremely confident in the brand that we've built and the trust that we've built with people because, you know, delivering good music is what's gotten us that goodwill. And because we've gotten that goodwill, we felt confident enough to say, hey, this is our offering. We're, you know, the record label, by the way, like woke up one day and realized we're putting an album out, you know? And it was, it was there, there's it was it was just our opportunity to say hey like to to every young artist in the world because when we were when when Drake was trying to get a record deal you got to remember like he was a white black Jewish Canadian kid who was trying to rap you know <laughs> and at that time like 50 Cent was the biggest rapper in the world so he hadn't like and 50 Cent just got shot nine times you know <laughs> and everybody was like you're never gonna make it it's like go home go back to Canada you know, go kick rocks, right? <laughs> and it was, okay, no problem, we'll go kick rocks. And we went and we sat, in, we sat in Toronto and we crafted music and we put it out for free on the internet and we had a hit record on that. On that. And if it wasn't for a direct-to-consumer opportunity that we had to go directly to our audience and directly to the people that we cared about, we would never have a career. If we waited for the middleman, the middleman was telling us, you're never gonna make it. We went, put the record out, and now the middleman is calling and saying, hey, uh. how do we get in business with you, you know? <laughs> so it's just, the, the idea is, is we're, we're just at a time now where in my business, that direct to consumer relationship is so important because it, it's your, it, it's, it's, that's your kind of goodwill. And to Paul's point, you can't use that goodwill to bank on a dollar because these people do actually care about what you have to say and these people do actually care about the products and the things that you have to offer so when you're doing that you have to be very smart about what you decide to offer those people because the minute you offer those people something that is not authentic and that looks like it's just a way for you to make a dollar or to take advantage of the fact that you've built goodwill with that person then that's the minute they're gonna like tune off and just give up on you because you need advocates, you know, and, and, and people, when you, when you have advocates and you have a way to get to those advocates and you create with those people in mind, you'll always have, you'll always have an opportunity to build a, build, uh, build a business. So hearing what I'm hearing from that end where athletes are taking their stories directly to the fan, cutting out the middleman, and you guys explaining about how you're taking things directly to the audiences that you're serving and you didn't even cut out you cut out late night shows and all the <laughs> interview shows i'm glad all my agents in the room uh as somebody who interviews athletes for a living uh and a talk show i mean am, am i am i a dinosaur with these types of <laughs> television and mere tele I'm, I'm i mean seriously i'm hearing that this is the future is there a future for conventional broadcasting in that a, way, Jeremy? I think there's absolutely a future for great entertainment, and that takes all kinds of forms, including interview shows. And I think what we'll see, and it'll be an interesting, I think it's an interesting moment right now. But I, I think where we're, what we're looking at is at this stage where you know, people talk a lot about disruption. I think we're just at the beginning of disruption in the media cycle. Right. You know, and I think the next phases are going to be how do we create shows that can go direct to a consumer, direct to an audience, and then what is the marketing and monetization around that? So I think, uh, you know, a great interviewer will always be able to put together a compelling show, a compelling program that people will want to see. It just doesn't have to arrive through the traditional forms, the question is how do we market it, make sure people know it's there, right? and how do we monetize it, make sure advertisers or subscription or whatever the model is, is going to be sufficient to pay for the content and make sure you get to make a couple of bucks. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. No, but I, I'm, no, I, I, honestly, I mean, I, I could pitch all these cards because I'm freaking out right now. No, but you know, Hang in there. He's yeah. going to be all right. The one thing you can rest assured on is the, the one thing that's always necessary when you have, when you're in a position like yours is is the cream of the crop will rise to the top and you're really great at getting things out of people that they might not necessarily be able to get out of themselves by curating or putting something together for themselves and you'll always be able to cover great events you know like I watch you cover the NFL draft and I get excited about your opinion and you extract opinions well, thank you. and and you do a great job of aggregating and pulling together and you work with players every day and you know 
I always watch, and if you were to leave those players up there by themselves to huh. do that without your guiding them and leading them and sending them in a direction, that expertise in broadcasting is important. I feel like I should yeah. hug you right now, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to see that. I feel like we should hug it out right I also now. Say, <laughs> I would also say, interestingly enough, we had that conversation about um, going direct, and, and you said interview show, is there a space for it? Probably our best performing show, or one of, definitely one of our, but probably our best performing show on Uninterrupted is an interview show. But it just happens to be about a topic, a very specific topic. Who's the interviewer on that show? I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. Who's the interviewer? Um, nice. It's, nice. It's, about a, it's about a topic. And Uninterrupted is a place where athletes feel very comfortable right. having a conversation that they wouldn't have on Fox or well, ESPN that's or gold. the big one. That's but gold. it's an interview show. Right. It's a sit down, just like your show, two people, an athlete in an interview, sitting down across from each other, having a conversation about financial awareness as an athlete. And the idea of what we talked about at Uninterrupted was an athlete's life is flipped. And no one's ever had that conversation. So all of us on this stage have went through our careers and we've gotten older, better, and made more money. Then we got older, we got better, we made more money. And that's the way the normal life of any person in business goes, if you're good, right? And an athlete's life is flipped. They're better and get paid more the younger they are. The minute they hit 30 or 35, it's over. It's like they go from making $10 million a year to zero. Right. So I said, guys, we should think about having that conversation with an athlete because no one's ever talked about the fact that if, if all of us in this room made all the money we were going to make between the ages of 20 and 30, and there's obviously, this is the Milken Conference, so I'm sure there's a lot of smart financial people in the room, we'd all, a lot of us in here would still fuck it up too if we made it between 20 and 30 because it's just, it's hard to figure out to go from having yeah. no money or little money to all of a sudden you've got a lot and you're 19 or 20, and then nine years later it's over. So that's very hard. So we wanted to have that conversation and let athletes tell that story. And we have athletes lining up out of the wazoo to be on that interview show because they're like, that's the, sh that's the conversation I want to have. Because my point was, I thought broke that was on ESPN was, was lazy. All it talked about was this athlete bought this big house, this athlete bought this car, paid for his mom this and this and that. But they didn't give you that understanding that we do on our interview show. So if you want to come work at Uninterrupted, Rich, you, you're, Maverick, we look, can cut the middleman out, Jeremy. No, we, can no. make, <laughs> we can make and we can make a deal today. Yeah, disintermediate. We're gonna have questions from the audience in a second, but we Paul, can disintermediate and make a can, deal, Rich. I'm, I'm very fair. Maverick. You and I can talk. Thank you. Rich. I'll take my talents Thank to uninterrupt it. <laughs> and br bring your cards with you. Bring your cards with you. We'll the rich my card, yes, you. absolutely. Paul, how many deals uh, on average are, are are brought to you and 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 oh, you? God. Are, are looking to do. <laughs> and, and what was the second part? And, or you're looking to do that. You, that oh. It's initiated by you, or it's just that your phone's ringing and you can are just you pick talk, and choose from that. Are you you're talking about deals, particularly with regard to celebrities, or you mean in general? Because it's Well, I guess let's do the celebrities since that's yeah. the, the situation um, here. That because everybody knows that we represent a lot of different celebrities and sports and music and, and movies and stuff, we do get a fair amount of that. I would say... I don't know. Uh, I would say every week we probably we see five new things that come in. Um, we also stop a lot of them before they sort of get too even too close to us. Not for any reason. We just can't handle it. Mm -hmm. But we probably see I don't know three to five new things. And uh, you know, people obviously it's like if you're in the position of, of uh, Future or Maverick. You kind of know when people are coming to you that you know there's a chance that they're thinking you know somewhere back there well LeBron you know or Drake whatever. With us, it's a little mixed because we do a lot of stuff also that isn't celebrity involved. But a lot of more and more people have sort of, I think Beats kind of blew the lid off what we were doing, and uh, more and more people are coming to us thinking well gee they represent all these different people and maybe those people could be valuable to what we're doing in our company. So we do see a lot, and it's just too much. You know, we have to, our job is to sort through it and to try and, if we can, if we can do, you know, I don't know, I say we see, say, three to five a week, and we probably only do, in that kind of genre, we probably do, you know, five or seven a year at most, hmm. at most. And that, some of them incubate for six months. You know, so 
it's 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 uh, like I said, it's it's not, it's not a given just because a celebrity's involved that it's going to go well. And what uh, Maverick and Future both said is really true: is that you, in addition to having the authentic, organic relationship between the celebrity and the brand, the celebrity and the idea, you really need a good person, founder, or CEO running the company. So if Brian walks in the door, you're going to be ten times you more. Me off. What? I did blow you off. We did blow you off. <laughs> but that was for business reasons. <laughs> nice. That was for a business reason. But if you know yeah. somebody like that walks in the door and they have a good idea, you're excited. Whereas if some, you know, I mean, and again, that's not to be an ageist, but you know, we see a lot of you know twenty somethings that come in the door and they never run a business in their life. I mean. We, we uh, saw a company a few years ago where I called the guy who, it was, he was going to disintermediate all the banks and no one was going to need banks anymore, no one was going to need credit cards, no one was going to need anything. Guy graduated from Stanford, he had already raised like $20 million at some stupid valuation and I called the guy who sent it to me who was also a kid and I said, that is the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. Which I was vindicated because Silicon Valley did half an episode on it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it's that bad that you have that many you know, bad people, bad ideas. When you team up a bad idea or a bad CEO with a big celebrity, it's nuclear. It's, or, or to say it like the guy in the next room would say it, it's nuclear. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it can be really, really bad for the celebrity, and so we have to be super careful. Uh, Art, I think uh, questions from the room? It's time to do that. If there's any questions in the room here for this panel. There's a microphone. There's some questions right up here. Is the caller there? Okay, very I was good. waiting for you to say that, Brian. I knew he was going to say that eventually. Um, I have a question about <laughs> some of the conflicts that can come up. So when you have individuals that are so talented and now you know really passionate about creating change in their communities or um, maybe with the last administration getting involved with causes that were really meaningful to them. Um, and so in particular, we were hearing uh, earlier today from Arian Foster, and he's talking about how he's now investing in better food and supporting those companies. Um, and then there are things like, so if you're, I'll use LeBron as an example because it, it's an easy one. You know, if you're doing uh, wonderful things for a community and talking about the kids that you grow up with and obesity is important and we want to have better food, but then you've got, you know, a 7-Eleven Slurpee deal or you've got a Sprite deal and then the First Lady wants you to be out there for the Let's Move campaign. How do you navigate making those, you know, making those deals, having boundaries around those deals, and also not jeopardizing both, obviously, your, your player uh, and your client you're concerned about, but also the credibility of the movement for bringing, you know, your talent on board. Well, I'll give a quick answer, and then I think they can answer, too. I think, I think that when, particularly when a celebrity gets to a point, whether it's an athlete or an actor, where they're, you know, wealthy enough and big enough, unless they're messed up and greedy, which would not be in our client base because we really wouldn't represent someone like that. They don't want to do stuff that's cheesy. They don't want to do stuff that's unhealthy. They don't want to do stuff that's bad for people. And so, you know, there's a lot of selection. I can tell you because, you know, I've worked with Arnold Schwarzenegger the longest of anyone. I've worked with him for oh, 25 years plus. You know, he tore up so many checks and didn't do so many deals because ah, I don't like that. It's not good for you. you know, he's really into health and fitness, obviously. So, but, but I think that any of these people, right, and certainly Drake, LeBron, anyone who gets to a certain level, it's just pure insanity to start promoting things that are bad for people or that are going to blow up in your face because you don't need it. But why don't you take yeah, it? Yeah, I would say that's, mm -hmm. that's extremely obvious. What Paul just said. Thank you. For sure. You're saying, <laughs> I mean, Thank you. You don't want anything that's going to blow up or be bad for people. But but I would but I would also say I mean it really it really truly comes down to what's authentic to you. So um, you know LeBron just opened up a school for kids in Akron, but he owns a pizza company. Is pizza bad for you? I mean, there's a lot of people you can get in the room who would argue bread and cheese is bad for you. He loves pizza. He eats pizza. So he gives his own kids pizza. So it's just what's, it's really you have to do what, to Paul's point, what, 
Arnold's going to do what feels right to him, what's authentic to you. And you can absolutely support a cause and build a school for kids what LeBron did and, and own a pizza company because he eats pizza and he gives his own kids pizza. So he can stand up and say, pizza's okay with me. Same thing. He, drink, he I don't know what I don't know where you got Slurpee from, but uh, <laughs> LeBron's never been anything to do with Seven Eleven. But I don't know where that came from. But Sprite, the same thing. He gives it to his kids and he drinks it too. So it's really what's authentic to you. You can't. You, you and and as long as he feels like as long as he can stand up, and it's authentic to me. Then he do it. The minute he didn't want to eat McDonald's anymore, we got rid of it. And they owed him money. To Paul's point, they owed him a lot of money. And he said, man. I went to him and said, hey, let's get out of this, and I got to figure it out, and we got out of it because he's like, I don't eat that food anymore, and I'm trying to stop my kids from eating it. So it's really, you really have to do what's authentic and what matters to you. Yes, sir. Craig Mullaney from Facebook. Um, my question is, what are what is most exciting to you about the emerging media, inclusive of social media environment, and what gives you most concern? Take I mean, for me, it's what he did, what you're doing, what I did, which is we're living in a time where guys like us can have an idea and, and have the skill to sort of back up that idea. And we don't have to go through what was this walled garden of Hollywood anymore, traditional media. So that's really just exciting and I, you know we were just talking about like you know you what are you gonna do next how many more of these can you do because it is there's amazing opportunity it's hard it's hard unbelievably hard to build these things but it's it's exciting on the on the flip side of it I think what Jeremy was talking about is still figuring out the monetization of building these companies and you know where it, where the money's gonna come from and where it's shifting to um, is is tough but I just sit here and go that's going to figure itself out if, if you good. get this part right yeah. and you're good. That's what I would say. If you're good, the monetization side figures out you have to be good and build something great that people give a shit about and care about and know what you stand for. But, this, but the part is you do have to figure out the monetization side of it before people like Facebook and Google take all of the money. Like, <laughs> because that's, that's the business you guys are in. <laughs> I, I would I would just agree with that is that the emergence of these huge platforms they were built on the idea that uh, intellectual property is free and uh, if they can have it they can use it and I think that you know there is a still a fundamental lack of respect for intellectual property in in that world of platforms and that needs to be addressed and that needs to be you know leveled and you see you know, as much as Spotify has been unbelievable for artists uh, as a discovery tool, it hasn't necessarily been as uh, fair for artists as an economic opportunity. And I'm excited about social media because my Twitter number goes up every day. Um, <laughs> certainly for somebody who's about to be disintermediated out of a house. <laughs> my children needing to be fed. Anybody else? Yeah, in the back. Hold on, the microphone's coming that way. Thank you. My name's Carrie Eldridge. I was, um, I've been following UTA a bit since I moved here from Paris a few years ago, and I'm trying to understand, you all seem to have a very close tie to art. Everyone says artwork. I was wondering uh, if you, Mr. Zimmer, if anyone on the panel were interested in working with a disruptive tech startup that's looking to disrupt the $64 billion art industry. We actually started a fine arts division at UTA about a year and a half ago. Um, and the thesis there is one, to provide additional service to artists, but it's also got its eye on how we can disrupt the sort of traditional system as it exists today. And, and we, we've evaluated a number of different startups in the space. We haven't found one that we think is going to be the right one for the artists that we work with, but it's something we definitely think there's a big opportunity there. Just one more? We'll take one more. You guys were saying that we're just at the beginning of the disruption of the media right now, and I was wondering if you could just kind of explain what you meant by that 
Jeremy, you, you said we're just at the beginning of disruption in the media. Um, are you talking about news media? Are you talking about? I'm saying just generally, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, you're seeing the impact already that, uh, that uh, Amazon, Netflix have had on the traditional media players. But I think we're at the first, you know, we're in the first quarter of that phase. And we're going to see, I imagine, a number of new entrants, both the established players, the Facebooks, the Googles, uh, et cetera, come in in a more significant way. That'll continue to disrupt the traditional media business. And I think you'll see new entrants come in. And I think knowing how, how, where, when, and for how much, uh, the, you know, the media business, what it will look like in 10, 15 years from now, I still don't, don't think we know. I don't think it's as simple as saying, oh, it's going to be Amazon and Netflix, and that's what's going to be happening. So I think we're still at a, very, at a pretty early stage in the cycle of disruption. And just real quick, if, if, coming back here, let's say we reconvene this panel three years from now. Just each of you real quick, what do you think is the next thing that we'd be talking about? You could look at it, even though you just said a virtual it. reality panel. We'll all be robots. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah. Future, what do you think? We'll take our driverless cars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, look, I think from a technology standpoint, things are really moving quickly and things are turning around and we're seeing all these companies take form. And I, I think in three years from now, what we're going to be talking about is, is the money, is how has the money changed? Who's getting paid what? Like, I'm, I'm excited. Me personally, I'm excited because I feel like I feel fortunate enough and, and lucky enough to work with somebody who I think is one of the most talented people on the face of the earth. And for guys like him, I'm excited about how many people want to buy what he has to offer. And the good thing about that as well is, is if somebody doesn't have the right offer, I, I feel like we can go do it ourselves. So it's just going to be a conversation about how have the terms changed, how has the money changed, how have the rights changed, and, and just getting an understanding because, you know, we're in a world where content is king. So, you know, when you follow the content and you lead with the content, we'll, we'll, we'll see how everybody adjusts and mobilizes because with this new kind of wave of these platforms and these different ideas, uh, I think content creators are now really waking up and saying, wow. You know, I think we were in a world where content creators never really thought about the business. They were just super excited to make the content. And now that, you know, you have people like myself and, and the guys that are, are with me here, me and Maverick talk about it all the time. It's it's. It's really our jobs, all of us here, it's our jobs to protect talent, right? So to Paul's point, what he was saying earlier, it's like if you have, a, you know, if you have an artist and you have you know, a bad CEO or a bad operator or something, or if you have a, and you have talent and those things come together, it could get nuclear. Well, there's even one step in the middle of that that can make it just as nuclear. You could have the greatest talent in the world and you could have a, a really good operator, and if the guy who sits in my seat or Maverick's seat is not good and helping push those two things together to make it right, then it's going to also go nuclear. So I think, you know, for us, I think it, it's just about uh, it's just about understanding and having and, and educating and all the agents and the different people in this room. I think it's about educating managers and educating the people that are in the middle that are working with the talent because the business people who are and you know and that's. We're, we're fortunate to work with Paul, who educates us all the time. I'm fortunate to be Mavs, one of my best friends. I get to talk to him all the time, and Jeremy gets together all the time. And the more I learn, the better I could serve Drake to then serve the businesses that he wants to be a part of. So that's kind of like that that kind of middle management spot, and I, I think is one thing we'll be talking about and, and educating people to make sure that they're servicing these big businesses and these big brands at a high level, and then also how do we extract more for the content creators from these platforms from a financial standpoint. Brian, you have two thoughts on this? A couple thoughts? I just think we're going to see legacy media companies look entirely different than they do today. I, I think they're, they're just not going to look the same. I mean, it's, it's already happening and I think it's going to happen faster. And How so? I think 
you know, his company, play, people like Facebook, and, and you know, you're seeing it with AT&T and Time Warner, and I just think it's gonna go quick, and, and they're gonna have to react like that, because their, their businesses are, are under duress because of what all of us up here have been doing, you know? Drake, I mean, I hate to speak for Drake, but I'm going to. D does he need a record company anymore? Probably not, right? He hasn't needed a record company in five years. Right. But he has one years, now, years, right? Yeah. But will he need one next year? Probably not. You know, and I think it's gonna it's gonna happen much faster than than people think. Maverick, what do you I, think? I would say it's gonna be right now. We're in a more, more, more. Create more content. There's more channels. There's Netflix. There's Amazon. There's Facebook's buying content, Twitter's buying content, it's just more, more, more. I think we're going to slowly see a shift back to less because the money is going to find its way to the better. It's going to go back to where it, the thing that always works is who are the best? Who is creating the best content? What is the content that the consumers want to see? They're going to be the judges ultimately because they always are. And it's going to get back to being less content in less places because all the money is going to flow that way. To Brian's point, is big media companies switch because they're create. They just been in this cycle for you know, I don't know, 50 or 100 years of creating more, buying more cable channels, creating more cable channels. ESPN one, ESPN two, ESPN three, ESPN eight. Blah, the Ocho, blah. yeah. So it's just going to be Ocho. less <laughs> and better. What'd you say? The Ocho. The Ocho. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Right. It's going to get back to being less. Is my prediction less but better? That's my prediction. Yeah. Paul. Yeah. I, I'm Probably maybe because I'm the older oldest guy in the panel. I, I don't think three years. I don't think I don't think it's going to be drastically different. I think number one to get back to the sort of point of this panel that we started with, brands are going to become are going to be as or more important than ever. I think that the the what's going on is just making brands more and more important. The power of celebrity is just getting more and more important, but that's not to say it's not important today, and it wasn't five years ago, but it's just because of the ability to go direct that so we see how many things are driven by celebrities and by social media, how many things, how you can create a brand out of nothing today. So I don't think that's going away. I also, by the way, you'll be happy to know, even though I'm the old guy here, I don't think reporters are going away. For the same reason, content, co reporters, reporters, as we were talking about it, Someone, someone still needs to, to frame, the, frame the argument, frame the question, ask the question. And if you're good at that, it's an incredibly valuable thing. I watched an interview uh, here yesterday where David Rubenstein uh, was interviewing Wilbur Ross, the new Secretary of Commerce. His questions, he's not a reporter, he's, he's a, 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 a private equity guy. But my point is his questions were so funny and so good that you just sit there and go, that's not going away. It's just the talent will not go away. And as someone who's on the board of Time Warner, I should disclose, I, I don't think, you know, the, what's happened in media has been great for Warner Brothers. I mean, Warner Brothers is, think of how many more outlets there are for content. You still have to be talented. You have to produce content. You have to be smart. As Maverick says, I think Maverick's saying in a nice way, what I would maybe say in a little less nice way, is there'll be less crap and there'll have to be more good content. But who are you going to go to? You're going to go to, you know, Warner Brothers has been the most successful television producer in history. Then there's independent producers who are successful, Dick Wolf, whatever. You're going to go to the people who can produce good content. So I don't think any of that's going to change, but the mechanisms of delivery are changing. Facebook's power in the, on the Internet is changing, and that continues to evolve. Twitter seems to be less powerful today. Snapchat, who knows where it'll be. But whatever it is, I think the core of good content and good brand and the power of celebrity. I don't think that's, if anything, it's going to get stronger, but it ain't going anywhere. Oh, great. Terrific. And reporters. I appreciate that. <laughs> Especially since uh, my show is on AT&T, so that's good. 9 good. to 12? 12 to 3 on the 12 East, to East Coast. 12 to 3. It's all about branding, Maverick. You know, I was I, thinking West Coast, 9 I'm to 12. Learning, and I'll see you on, inter on, on Interrupted very yes, soon. Absolutely. Okay, uh, that's our panel, everybody. Thank you.